Oh, that was great. <clears throat> and <clears throat> whew, I'm just super, super excited um, that this is what we'll be studying um, the next couple of months, the women of faith that are in the Bible. It's so timely, and I know that we say that a lot, right? We always say, oh, it's good to know whatever we're studying seems so timely, but God is good, and he meets us right where we're at. And I think in our world today, they're constantly trying to identify what a woman is, what a woman should be, what a woman looks like, what a woman acts like, uh, what our roles are in society, what our character should be, what our place in society should be. And I just thought, like, how perfect that God picks now that he wants to remind us who he says that we are. And that is what's most important. So before we start, let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that we are created in your image, Lord, that um, you created us uniquely and individually. We're your daughters, God. We're, um, we're just amazed by the wonder, Lord, and just the awe that you created us to be who we are, Lord. And we just pray that as we study different women in the Bible, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would grow us, that any kind of doubts or questions or things that we're confused about, Lord, that you would just set us straight, Lord, through your word, that we would learn, that we would glean, Lord, the things that the women that have gone before us have learned from you, God. And um, Lord, help us not to overlook the small details, God, and just um, to see the thread that you weave through each person's life. Lord, the thread that you're weaving in each of our lives. Lord, we want to draw close to you, Lord. We want to be those women of God that you've called us to be, and how can we apart from your word? And so teach us, Lord. Lord, help us to be content in all things, challenge us, convict us, just cause us to wiggle in our seat sometimes, Lord. Whatever it is that you have for us in these next couple of months, Lord, we want to take it all in. Lord, we um, give you this time this morning, and we ask that you bless it, that you would speak to us, challenge us, Lord. Um, just help us to draw nearer to you than when we walked in this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so I thought about also like how a lot of people out in the world, they think if, if they talk to a Christian woman, oh, the Bible is so anti-women, right? Isn't that what we get a lot of? That it teaches that, um, oh, women are just doormats for society to walk all over. But they haven't read what the Bible says because if they actually read the Bible, there's no way in the world that they would be able to say things. Um, there's women in the Bible who risked their children's lives. They risked their own lives. They stood up for what they knew was right and what they knew was holy. Women who were leaders in society, women who were leaders in their church, women who were prayer warriors. That's the women that are in the Bible. That is who God created women to be. There's nothing better, in my opinion, than a woman who is strong, who is fierce in her convictions, who is on fire for the Lord, who is a Jesus-loving, amazing Christian woman. And we need to, to take that. We need to take that with us and share that with other people around us who, who have no idea why God created women, or they're, they're just listening to magazines or listening to um, spokespeople on the news or something that are trying to um, say who Christian women really are. We have women such as Rahab and Deborah and Esther, Ruth. We have J.L., Abigail, Hannah, Mary, Lydia, Elizabeth, Phoebe, Priscilla, so many more than I could even mention here. So many who are strong women. Women are not weak. We're meek. We should be meek, but not weak. God made us strong. He made us courageous. He made us to be vessels of honor to the Lord. The women in the Bible who were married, single, widowed, some whose names that we do know, 
they're recorded in the Word. Some, we don't know their name, but they are known by God and to God. And as society sets out to define us or even redefine us anymore, may we not forget what kind of women God made us to be. We are fearfully and wonderfully made by Almighty God. We are created in his image. We are the apple of his eye. We are his treasure. We are his workmanship that he created to do good things. We are very precious in his sight. We are so loved by Almighty God. And as we take a look at some of the women in our study, we're going to see that really and truly they're not much different than we are, right? They're women, ordinary women who are loved and used by an extraordinary God. They're women who made good decisions. Some of them made poor decisions. Some of them followed the, the ways of the Lord at all times. Some of them didn't. Some got lost along the way. They had flaws. None of them was perfect. God's not looking for perfect women because if he was, he wouldn't find any because apart from Christ, none of us can be perfect. Some of them were opinionated, right? Aren't you glad for the ones that God saw fit that he would put in the Bible? Women who were strong in their own opinions and had to kind of be like, molded and shaped and um, brought a little bit down and made it more into his image. They had flaws. Some of them had less than perfect paths, but they were redeemed and they were restored. And I was saying, telling Yvonne this morning, um, I popped into the leaders meeting um, for prayer and I was kind of overwhelmed by the goodness of God. Because every year, you know, every um, semester, I don't know what we call it, every season, to just see the hand of God in this church, to see what God is doing, to see people that we know, some people we know their past. We see when they walked in the doors for the very first time and they were shy. They didn't know, what am I doing here with this group of women? But we see God transform them. God calling them into, you know, different roles in the church, serving him. This is what it's about. It's about serving our Jesus and to see how God changes things around. He never keeps us in the same spot. He challenges us. He calls us out to serve him, to take those steps of faith, not on our own strength, but in the strength that he gives us. And I'm just so, so blessed to see so, so many women. You know, we talked about getting that phone call, right? I think that um, sometimes we remember the phone call or nowadays the email. Would you like to serve? God is always asking us the same question. Would you like to serve me? What is our response? And so today, we're going to take a little look at Martha and Mary, along with their brother Lazarus, who were friends of Jesus. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke 10, and we're going to read verses 38 to 42. <clears throat> I always have to re write it down because my bio, I need a bigger print Bible. <laughs> Um, now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, Jesus, and a certain woman named Mary, or Martha, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Do you think you would ever speak to Jesus like that? No, not us, right? We would never raise our voice or tell him what to do. And I know a lot has been said about our dear sister Martha, but really the boldness, the boldness that she had to approach Jesus as she did and say the things that she was saying, to give him orders Tell him what to do. Jesus, look at what she's doing. Look what I'm doing. Make her stop. 
Sounds like a little toddler, right? Or one of the spats that our kids have at home. Mom, look what he's doing. It's not fair. I'm the one that's doing all the work. He's not helping me. We sound just like that sometimes, right? If we admit it. But accusing Jesus of not caring. Have we done that? Maybe not in those words, but in our doubts, in the fears that we have, in the unfairness that we face. Sometimes we find ourselves accusing Jesus. Maybe we use sweeter words. Maybe we put them more poetically than Martha did. But we're guilty of the same thing. He's not running. She's all mad because he's not running to Mary and telling her, hey, stop listening to what I have to say. Okay. Mary, or Martha becomes agitated. She's upset and she's frustrated. And Jesus answered Martha. And he says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Have you been frantic? Have you been frustrated? Have you had it up to here sometimes in life? in the busyness of your day, and all of a sudden, you're complaining to Jesus about it, and then he stops you. He has with me. And I don't think Jesus was yelling at Martha. You know, it's one of those teaching moments, and he's like, Martha, Martha, listen to me. I've heard him say it to me, Margie, Margie, listen. Stop talking, right? Because when we're frustrated, when we're agitated, what do we do? Blah, 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 blah. We have a whole list of things that we've been holding on to, and then finally, it just pours out of us. It's kind of like slow down. Take inventory of what you're actually saying, and let's get real here. Let's see what is the most important thing. Notice that Jesus didn't tell Martha that Mary was the better person. Mary's decision was the better choice, the better part. Her choice to sit and listen to what Jesus had to say. Listening to him was better. And Jesus also did not tell Martha to stop serving. He didn't say, hey, Martha, quit it. I don't need you to serve. No, the two go, go together. We can't stop serving. Jesus tells us that we need to be the servants of all. He was a servant. He served others. He wants the same for us. But we need to do both. We need to serve and we need to sit. But we cannot serve until we sit. We can serve in our own strength, right? All of us women, we know how to serve. We know how to do. But Jesus wants us to take that time away and spend it with him first. But when we do serving, when we serve others, when we do our to-do lists, without spending that time with Jesus, we become just like Martha. We get angry. We get frustrated, agitated. We start to feel sorry for ourselves, and we look around and we just want to accuse others and behave like we're martyrs. Oh, it's all left to me. Nobody else is going to do this. I've got to do it. Right? I think we can all relate to that. Nobody has it as hard as I have it. Nobody cleans up. Nobody rinses their dishes. Nobody turns their socks on the right side. Right? Woe is me. We have to put it in check. Laundry's not always fun. But if we learn to get into the habit of doing it as unto the Lord, it might be a little funner. Not guaranteeing it, but we serve the Lord. And so we have to start changing our attitude and thinking about things when we are doing something for others. We serve the Lord first, and we changes our attitude. We don't want to become distracted from what really matters in life and spending time at the feet of Jesus. 
getting his mindset, having his heart as he serves. Do you think that Jesus liked always hanging around with the crowds? No, but he always took that time to get away. He took time that he needed to spend time with his father. And if Jesus did that, then how do we think that we can serve without sitting? We're, we can't. We're experts at doing, getting done what needs to get done, but it's the heart that matters to Jesus. It's our always going to be the heart attitude that matters most. And how can we have the heart of Jesus if we don't spend time with him? How can we have his heart for others if we don't know his heart first? He's the source of joy that we have when we serve. His word gives us the wisdom that we need to know how, who, what, where to serve. His word gives us the strength to do the things that we don't ordinarily want to do. His word gives us the love, the compassion, and the right heart to follow through in the areas of serving that Jesus calls us to do. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But how often we just take the first part of that verse, I can do all things. We're Wonder Woman. We can do it all. But we forget the second part of that, through Christ who gives us the strength to do what he's calling us to do. His word is so vital in our lives. We need his word to guide us to show us, to give us all we need to do what he's calling us to do. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need his word to guide us and direct us, to give us strength. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a humbling verse. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Because we think and we're kind of created in this way that we can do everything. But, are we doing it in his strength? Are we doing it with Jesus? Are we just doing it by ourselves? We can serve and we can do, we can make, we can prepare. But what is our attitude? What is the attitude of our heart? What is our priority? Is our priority like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus? Now, we don't want to take it too far, right? I would like to be like, I think I did try it early in marriage, like, Dear, why are the dishes piled up, he says to me. Well, because I am spending time reading my Bible. <laughs> no, there's a balance, right? We sit and then we serve. We just don't, you know, become like hazy-eyed or something and, and, and get lazy because that's not Jesus either. We sit at his feet and then we get up and we do what he's calling us to do. Jesus wanted to teach Martha the heart of a servant and that's what he wants to teach all of us to the heart of a surge, of a servant, not a surgeon. Jesus spent time with his father, and so ought we. Remember, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We're going to be imitators of Christ. And then we move on to John 11, where we're going to read a little bit more about Mary, Martha, and their bro brother Lazarus. But this time, Lazarus is very ill. And the sisters, Mary and Martha, had sent a message to Jesus to come quickly. But Jesus didn't come as quickly as they had hoped. So in John 11, verses 20 through 27, we read, And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And why am I saying it like that? Because I think that we respond sometimes to Jesus like that. We've we're, got our minds set on something else. We're preoccupied with what we need to do or with what's going on around us. And Jesus is trying to tell us who he is, what he wants to do, what he will do, what he has done. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it. I've read it. Been to the Bible study. We don't take time to digest what Jesus is saying to us. We don't take it in. We're not hiding his word in our heart. Jesus spoke one of the most powerful I am statements to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And Jesus asked her, do you believe this? He asks us. In those still moments of our life, he challenges us when we read his word. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe that every word in our Bibles is truth? And when a question is asked, there's an answer. There's a response. Martha believes who Jesus is. We believe who Jesus is. And she sort of affirms what he says, right? But what does she do? She runs. She's got to run to go and get her sister Mary, who's at the house, and let her know that Jesus is there. Our mind and our hearts can be so preoccupied with our own thoughts and fears that we don't stop. We don't take time to be still and know. Not just know, but know that he is God. And Mary and Martha are besides themselves with grief right now, and they're not very happy that Jesus seemingly took his time to get to them. But Jesus, what did he do? Did he rebuke them? No. He met them. He met them in their grief. He met them in their sorrow. He wept, knowing that Lazarus was in the grave. He wept seeing the grief on Mary and Martha and all of the others that were around there. He knows our pain. He knows our sorrow. He knows the grief that we're going through. He even understands the questions that we have, the doubts and the fears that we have. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He is our great comforter. Nobody else can comfort us like Jesus can. Both Martha and Mary said these words, if only you were here. Have you been in situations in your life where you said, Jesus, if only you were here? Because in those times of grief and sorrow, we feel abandoned at times. We feel like if Jesus was truly here, he would have fixed it immediately. He wouldn't delay. He wouldn't allow the things that he's allowing to happen. He wouldn't allow people to be sick or people to leave us. He wouldn't allow jobs to be lost, children to go astray. If only you were here, Lord. We know that God can do the miracle, right? If we were to raise our hand, how many of us believe God can do a miracle in our lives? He can do miracles in the lives of those we love and we care about. But the problem lies not in the fact that we know he can, but why didn't he? Why won't he? Why won't he cure her? Why won't he bring our prodigals back home. And then the enemy comes in in our weakness. See, he's not real. See, he really doesn't care and starts to get us to want to doubt what God's word has said, to doubt who Jesus is. But 
But it's in those times that we need to put our hope and our trust and our faith in him all the more. To pray, to sit at his feet, to ask him to comfort us. He's working miracles behind the scenes that we don't know about, that we can't see with our human eyes. He's working. We sing that song, even when we can't see it, he's working. Do we believe this? Or are we so caught up in our own sorrow and our own disappointments that we take our eyes off of him and we let doubt and fear come in? There's nothing that the Lord does or doesn't do that isn't a part of his plan, even when we're struggling to understand it. It's in these times that we must stay connected. We must abide in the vine as our source of life, as our, our source of strength, our source of hope. Everything that we need to stay connected and not let the enemy come in with his lies to cause us to doubt. God's timing is never going to be our timing. He has a different timetable than we have. He has a bigger and a better plan. He's going to do something amazing, just like he did with Lazarus. And you know, I think it's awesome. When you think about that little verse that we all know, the shortest verse in the Bible, that Jesus wept. Jesus wept, but he knew. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But isn't it amazing that he still wept? He didn't have a superhero face on him. Ah, oh, what do you guys see what I'm going to do? No. He wept because he loves, because he cares, because he has compassion, because he feels within his, his heart what his children are going through. There was so much more to the story that Mary and Martha did not know. It wasn't just about Mary and Martha or even Lazarus. It was what Jesus was going to do. There were so many on that day that had never believed in Jesus and they were there and they were saved that day because they heard Jesus's voice they heard him cry out, Lazarus, come forth. And they were amazed. They were astonished, and they believed. And sometimes it's not about us. And it's hard when we're suffering, when we go through loss, when we go through pain, and we can only see right, what's right in front of us. But God sees the big picture, even if we don't. But we have to learn it's not something that comes automatically. We see the faithfulness of God because we've experienced it. We've experienced what he has done. Even if it didn't go according to our plan, he remains faithful and he does things that goes beyond what we can see. They believe, the crowd believed that he was the Christ. And that was the true miracle. The true miracle that hearts that were hardened were turned to Christ. And sometimes God is going to allow the pain. He's going to allow suffering. He's going to allow us to be shaken. And he's going to allow our faith to be tested. And it seems so unfair. But Lord, I'm just following you. I'm doing, I'm doing everything you've asked me to do, but it's still not working out. You're allowing all these things to come in my life. Hardships, broken relationships, sickness. He has a plan. We, like Mary and Martha, we know that God loves us. But when he delays, when he doesn't work according to our timetable, our faith is going to be tested. But it's important that we learn to trust him 
no matter his timetable, to trust him no matter the outcome. Because all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All things. We either believe that, and so Jesus asks us today, do we believe this? Do we believe that all things work together for him? Mary and Martha witnessed God's glory in a way they never would have if Jesus had not delayed. He could have easily gone there right when they asked for him. And he could have put his hand on Lazarus when he was still ill and made him all better, but he didn't. And there was a plan and there was a purpose and they didn't understand it at the time. But we see Mary later on doing what? Taking that beautiful, expensive bottle of oil and breaking it open and washing the feet of Jesus because she knew. Over here, she was distraught and fearful, a little bit angry and upset. But then she saw Jesus. She saw his faithfulness. And she sat at his feet and washed his feet with her oil. In Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God who performed miracles is still the God who performs miracles. The God who delayed, he still will delay. According to us, he never it delays in his own way. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Great, can we say that? Great is his faithfulness. And again, he says, do you believe this? Do you believe that he is faithful? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I end with this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all of our ways, every way. Submit to him and he will make our path straight. He will never fail us. He loves us. He wants to use us to do miracles in and through our lives. He wants to grow us, to challenge us, to change us. He wants to use us as vessels of honor to bring glory to his name through the trials, through our grief, through our fears, through our discomfort. Will we let him? Let's pray. Lord, we know that your word says that apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, how often we try in our own energy to do what's pleasing to you. Lord, to um, just go in our own strength, in our own ways, with our eyes off of you. Lord, we have schedules. We have things that we have to do in our day things that we're responsible for. But Lord, help us, teach us, Lord. Would your Holy Spirit just give us that nudge, that conviction that we need to first seek you, to seek your face, Lord. You said to seek your face, and we want to seek your face. We want to seek your will. We don't want to get all worked up doing the things that are in our to-do list apart from you because we know how it ends up, just frustrated and just feeling defeated if we don't tick every box by the end of the day. Lord, help us to just throw our arms and lift up to you, God, in praise and worship and in thanksgiving that we would gain our strength from you. 
Lord, help us in our weaknesses and our frailties. Lord, in the things that we don't understand and the whys that we, we ask, to trust you, to not lean on our own understanding, Lord, but to just say, okay, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust. To be like that father that said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, help us to be holy and surrendered completely to you. To be those women of God that you created for your good, Lord. Help us to just sit at your feet each day before we start our day, Lord, whether it's five minutes or longer, whatever it is, God, that we acknowledge you in everything that we do. Give us your heart. Give us your wisdom. Give us your power. Give us your strength to do all that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name.